So I'll um, speak about a, a variety of topics. In, in I, I try to achieve two goals, one of them telling you a little bit about genetical genomics and integrating multiple molecular layers, which really nicely connects to the first talk we heard about today, about heritability models by David Balding. And then at the end, I will make an a transition to, to a new field, single cell genomics, which we have a practical in the afternoon. Neil and Max asked me to talk about this technology, and I will also try to somehow bring across why this might be useful for personalized health and what this um, workshop is about. Um, so these are the two themes I'm trying to bridge here. On the one hand, we're interested in understanding variation between people, um, understanding how differences between these people, which might predominantly be, for say, genetic, be linked to difference in phenotype. On the other hand, we might also be interested in other sorts of variation. One variation, actually, I'm going to talk about in the second part of the talk, is single cell variation. And sort of the bridging theme is that in both of these types of analysis, we have the problem of removing or adjusting for variation we might not care about. We, we heard about um, pedigree models and the, the, the notion of understanding relatedness and how relatedness and heritability translates into heritability and the heritable variation phenotype. That's the positive side of it. There's also a negative side of it, namely that many of these covariances actually confound our analysis. And I will, will show you some results on how we can adjust for such confounding factors, population differences, relatedness. And it turns out that the very similar types of ideas also apply to other, other domains. We'll briefly touch based on the idea that almost all data in biology is not IID. And that's perhaps one of the sort of take home messages from this talk. There's nothing IID, and I'm giving you two examples here where non-IID data sets really play a role and come into play and need to be adjusted for. Um, so why looking at anything else than phenotype? A very nice introduction of linking genotype to phenotype. We might either do this in a single variant approach where we associate single polymorphic position of genome to phenotype, or we may do so in more complicated models, um, variance component models, heritability-based analysis. But there's this other domain that is now really start becoming really accessible, and that's understanding all the different layers in between genotype and phenotype. This might be the molecular layer at the level of transcriptome, proteome, epigenome. And we have this belief that genetic differences somehow need to manifest the difference of the molecular layer before they then propagate to phenotype and ultimately cause what we then observe a slight increase in disease risk or a slight decrease in disease risk or any other phenotype of interest that we might be interested in understanding. So there is a question about how to analyze this data properly. And now, in our days, we really have very, very deep characterized multi-omics level data set studies. I have one example of the study we're involved in. It's an IPS biology study where we really have epigenetic data. We have transcriptome data, proteome data. It's even single cell data for the same individuals. And the question is, how can we leverage this to understand phenotype? And how can we leverage this particularly to reinterpret links between genotype and phenotype and, and, and leverage that for making predictions about personalized medicine um, or other purposes. So these big data sets, they, they, they come sort of with two types of um, uh, sides of a coin. On the one hand, there are severe challenges. Um, I've here put also on this brief example really some numbers. So if you look at the number of variants in the human genome, we're talking about 80 million common variants in the latest 1,000 genomes projects. We have tens of millions of features. But now in the new studies, we also have this problem of, of, of large n. So we have hundreds of thousands of individuals. The UK Biobank is, is going to provide genotype data for half a million people. So statistically speaking, this is large N and large P, which obviously um, requires methods that are efficient that scale to data sets of this type. A second challenge, if you have really many, many phenotypes, is the total number of hypotheses. If you imagine looking at transcriptome data, you have on the order of tens of thousands of molecular traits. And interlinking all of these possible hypotheses to all variants and genomes are, are billions of hypotheses to be considered. And this statistical power is a, is a real, real consideration. <coughs> what I also mentioned earlier is really confounding. And that will be something that you will sort of see throughout this talk, that basically the individuals, we can't treat them as independent. They can't treat them as unrelated if you think about genetically. But rather, there's different levels of structures, both genetic structures, but also non-genetic structures, and how individuals are related both on their genetic level, but also on other types of information, let it be covariates, smoking, non-smoking, batch, and so forth. And it's really important to account for these. So that's the challenge. But there's also a, a, a good positive side to these large data sets. And that is we have now the ability to really infer many of these structures. We can, we can leverage large data sets to reconstruct, for example, related structures, as we heard very nicely in the first talk today. We can leverage large data sets to, for example, leverage multiple phenotypic readouts and not analyzing phenotypes one by one, but rather tie them together in meaningful ways, for example, analyzing effects and pathways, analyzing related phenotypes. 
and that's sort of the opposite side of that. And I will particularly talk about models that sort of try to overcome the challenges with some of these wins. I want to start with a very brief illustration to really just say what is a basic problem of structure and confounding. And this is data from a very typical example, which means one of the extremes example actually comes from my, my postdoctoral time, and that is Arbidopsis and Arbidopsis GVA. So we're linking individual variants in the genome. These are here on the x axis. We're testing these SNPs for an effect on phenotypes. It's a simple linear regression based association test. And if you perform this analysis on this phenotype, which in this case is flowering, that asks how many days does it take until the plant flower, we get this very strange answer that basically all the genome is associated. And that, that answer can't be right. It doesn't make sense that all positions in the genome of Arbidopsis are controlling flowering. I think that is clear. And what is really happening here is that this huge inflation. So this is a comparison of an expected p-value distribution under the assumption that almost all variants in the genome are coming from the null versus the actual analysis. And we see there's a huge inflation of the test statistics, which suggests there's something going wrong. There's something happening that makes many more of these tests come, seemingly come from the non-null than they actually do. So what's going on here is that basically individuals are not independent. So in the very in extreme case, we have two populations, population, population one, population two. And then we can adjust for these population structures by including suitable covariates in the model. There are two ways to do this. We can either just say there's a categorical variable, either saying, are the individuals from population one or two? Or what is very effective is actually using random effect models, which is exactly using these kinship estimates or these estimates of relatedness with all the caveats and limitations that we really nicely heard about in the, in the morning and adjust for them in the analysis. So we're asking, factually, a refined question. We're asking, how much more does A vary in the genome, let's say this SNP here, explain phenotype than a suitable background model? And that background model, in this case, encodes the idea that these top three individuals, these guys here are closely covariating, the bottom ones are closely covariating, which is exactly representing this population structure. Now the question is, how can we estimate these covariance matrices? And I really, really refer to um, um, the very nice presentation but David Boulding really realized relationship is one typical way, but there are many caveats and do so. But just to make the point that really there are different types of covariance matrices. This is one where we have sort of three discrete clusters. So this is population one, population two, population three. We can sort of see individuals nicely clustering these blocks. There could be also more complicated settings. For example, here, this is family structure where individuals are pairwise related depending on whether they are in within one family or whether they're not in one family. And this is sort of the ideal case where there's sort of no structure at all. So this genetic structure, you can, you can understand that basically is a hidden common cause on your SNPs. Your variants are not independent, but rather there's this coupling process, which actually is inheritance, that entire blocks of your genome are inherited together. And because of this co-inheritance, they are correlated. And hence, an analysis that assumes independence across variants will, will, will be doomed to um, overestimate the number of associations that are actually truly happening. If you go back to our Arbidopsis example, and really just I want to use this illustration, if we now um, revisit this analysis and account for structure, we get a much more meaningful answer. Here in this case, there are just three loci that are associated that is perhaps closer to the ground truth than what we've seen before. So just as a side, this is the most extreme example you can possibly think of. And the reason is plants can't run away. They're pretty stationary located. And hence, you have this very extreme confounding of adaptation and geography, which, which leads to this type of population structure. But you see very, very similar effects also in human. It's just not as, as illustrative as, as shown here. So there are different ways how we can leverage these types of models that I talked about. This basic model is you have a phenotype. You explain that by some fixed effects you might be interested in varying your testing. There's this effect of this kinship matrix, which, for example, could be just a realized relationship matrix or any other way to estimate um, kinship and the residual noise. I mentioned association testing, where we effectively compare a model that assumes a variant has an effect to a model that assumes a variant has no effect. So that might be a likelihood ratio test or some other way to assess significant of this position here. And these are the results I have shown you before. We can do heritability estimation, which is effectively looking at the ratio of the variance explained by the structured component that assumes the relatedness matrix explains variation to the residual component. That's exactly what we heard from this morning. And there might be also um, ways to leverage this to do predictions. So BLOOP, the best linear unbiased predictor, is exactly derived from these models. And in the machine learning world, this is also used, known actually as a Gaussian process with a linear covariance function. So there has been a lot of work in making these models efficient. As mentioned before, scale is one. And there are sort of two, I think, papers that really did crack the problem that have been um, basically publishing the same algorithm 
and subsequently one by Christoph Lippert et al. And, and Matthew Zeeven and Zhu, they have basically derived a similar algorithm and they leverage the idea that we don't have to invert the covariance matrix of this big multivariate normal in every single iteration we do the association tests, but rather we can basically transform our data spectrally, which leverages an eigen decomposition of this covariance matrix, and then look in a space where basically the individuals are independent, they're IID, and hence there's just a diagonal noise covariance. And that really gets to the idea that I mentioned earlier that there's a close relationship between adjusting for covariance matrices and non-ID sample structure. And you can imagine that if you include these covariance matrices, it's a bit like rotating your data into a space such that you can safely treat them as independent samples and ignore the covariances they entail. And there's a one-to-one -one mapping between these two operations simply by basically taking the, the, the symmetric eigen decomposition of K and, and adjusting your data accordingly. So there have been a number of, of extendons, extensions of, um, of dynamics models, and this is quite heavily biased to some work we've been doing. And um, uh, one really in, in, inter interesting question is, what is the quantitative scale on which these traits live? So do you want to model your phenotypic trait on a linear scale? Do you want to model that on a log scale, on a square root scale? If you have a continuous readout, that's a very important question because you assume this linear additivity. And we heard that linear additivity is common in genetics, but the question is, on what scale do genetic variants act, linear additivity? And it turns out you can actually nicely address that by incorporating a parametric transformation of your phenotype into this Mongo. And it's a nice collaboration with Nicola Fusi and, and Neil Lawrence, where we actually use concepts of machine learning to address that. There's a second challenge, which we are um, also not going to talk much about here, which is accounting for the fact that variants might have non-additive effects, that it's not additive, that we have really exceptions from the rules. And there are, there are by now also methods to efficiently account for that, uh, for example, using regression tree approaches, that we can really account for the effect of non-additivity uh, between pairs of variants that collectively um, contribute to phenotypic differences. The one um, ap approach I want to briefly mention here in a bit more detail is, is, is adjusting for multiple correlated traits because there's a nice connection to, to actually to machine learning methods and kernel methods that many of you in the audience actually might be, might be familiar with. So what we try to address here is, is this sort of idea that we want to go beyond associating single variants in the genome to single phenotypes. And there are sort of two ways how we could think about generalizing this. The first really, again, going back to um, the talk this morning, is, is looking at more than one variant, but rather looking at groups of variants. So you can imagine you want to partition your genetic variants into a variant region you're interested in, let's say the variants in a gene, or in an exon, or in an intron, or some other entity of the genome you might be interested in, and everything else. And these methods have been used for rare variant association tests, or also accounting for allelic heterogeneity, and i.e. multiple variants that are causative for phenotype, for example, in a single gene. Um, there's this other direction, which also people have been looking at, which is taking single variants and associating them to multiple phenotypes. And really, we, we just completed the square here and looked at the question, can we associate groups of variants in the genome, let's say regions in, in a particular gene, to multiple phenotypic readouts? Phenotypic readouts that might be related, for example, because the genes in the same pathway, because these are multiple uh, lipid traits that are related to one another, or other phenotypes where you assume that some gain by modeling not one-to-one -one relationship, but rather tying together these different um, phenotypes in comprehensive ways. In the same terms, we want to account for the fact that relatedness again, so basically individuals are not ID, but there's rather some sort of confounding. Let me see whether that here is, oh, that works better. Um, relatedness is sort of confounding, and there's also the question of why these phenotypes are correlated. So the I think the intuition is genetics may be some contribution as to why phenotypes co-vary, but that's not exclusively the only reason why phenotypes might be correlated. And hence, it's important to dissect this correlation into the components that we can explain by genetics and other sources of co-variation, for example, environment or, or other exposures. So statistically, it's very simple. It's basically, it's a multivariate normal model. We have individuals here, the phenotypes. I'm using these four traits as an example, but you can obviously use any other number. You could include covariates, so this might be sex, age, and, and other cofactors you might not be interested in. You have these variants you're interested in, so these are the variants in the region you're testing, so the particular set that you want to consider. Then there's again this relatedness component, this accounts for the fact that the individuals are not ID, but they have this sort of global relatedness structure, and then there, there's residual noise that basically accounts for everything else. And in this framework that we chose to use here, these three terms here are 
are random effect terms. So basically, these are uh, multivariate normal distributed with covariances in the row space between individuals and covariance in the column space between phenotypes. And, and again, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. You can also write this down as a rich regression model, which actually will, I will come to just in one moment. So more formally, if we set that up here, we can also um, um, write, write that more notationally. So x here are the genetic variants, which is enumerate. So these are the features, 1 to f. Um, y are the phenotypes, which we can again enumerate from 1 to t. t is the number of traits that we're considering here. And there's a very simple way to motivate that model, and that is again by writing it down as a linear regression. So for every trait t, we write that trait as a sum of variance in the, 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 um, the region of interest. So this is the region, the set, let's say, the gene that we're interested in. These are the variants of interest. And these are all the variants in the rest of the genome that we don't care about in this case. So we want to look at this contrasting variance about how much variance does this set explain versus this. And you can see the effect sizes here now depend on the trait. So every trait has its own effect size for every variant. And the noise level here, again, depends on the trait T. And now all we do is we place basically multivariate normal priors on these weights. So basically, the weights are independent across variants, but they co-vary across traits. So we make the assumption that the magnitude of genetic effects are correlated across phenotypes. They're not independent. And this correlation or co-variation is encoded in this covariance matrix, which is a T by T matrix. And this applies both for the foreground effects as also for the background effects. And also the noise has a a trait trait covariance matrix that shows how covarying, how much correlate are these traits independent of genetic effects. Now it turns out because everything is Gaussian, we can actually marginalize out these models and look at the marginal likelihood of this model. And this is tractable because everything is normally distributed, it's very convenient. And then what we get is this very interesting model that basically says we vectorize all the phenotypes, we stack them on top of one another, phenotype one, two, three, four, that's what this vector operation does. And the covariance, the sum of this RU psi term that I mentioned before, this is the region term, this is the background term, this is the noise, and this is chronic products between the sample covariance, so the covariance between individuals here on the right, this is the, the background, this is the region, and the trait covariances that tell you how do these individual terms shape correlations between phenotypes. So this here looks at the trait correlation because the region term, this is the trait correlation because the background, and this residual noise. And it's important to actually make the point, perhaps, since many people here from machine learning, this model is actually one-to-one -one related to multitask Gaussian process model that's been proposed elsewhere. Effectively, this is a multitask Gaussian process model with the linear covariance functions in these two types of features, both the local features that we focus on and the background features, and then there's residual noise. So this is a really a nice illustration about how these fields are connected. We could also use a nonlinear covariance, let's say squared exponential kernel or other things, as many people in the audience may consider. Now, there is a challenge, and that is um, computational speed. Um, naively, doing inference on these models scales cubically in the number of individuals and phenotypes. But you can use, again, tricks from spectral decomposition to, to break down these computations. And the, the key insight is that many of these covariances are actually fixed if you slide along the genome. In particular, this related this term here is constant. And you can pre-compute many of these computations and, and, and use similar tricks in a I mentioned earlier. I don't want to go into details, but you can really break this cubicle decomposition into something that's cubicle in n up front, and then it's linear in n and quadratic in p for every single test that you're doing. And that allows you to use these methods on, on genome scale. You can be even quicker if you assume that these individuals are unrelated. So if you, if you drop that term, which sometimes may be valid, sometimes may not be, then you can get to something that is linear in n, that scales linear with the number of individuals and phenotypes. So that's, that's something we, we recently um, looked at here to, to scale these models up. You can, you can now evaluate these models on really large cohorts for up to half a million people. If you assume unrelated cohorts, this is this unrelated model, or this full model here scales to roughly 20,000 people, which is, which is useful for many analysis and practice, but previously you were sort of stuck here at 1,000 individuals at the very most, which is really not, not adequate for many genetic analysis. So this time here is the CPU hours for, for analyzing one human chromosome. So it's, this is all quite expensive if, you, if you're considering really genetics in, in, in practice. I also want to make the point that really combining multiple phenotypes and multiple um, variants in these sets can, can help in practice. So these are the two axes we might consider here. This is asking in simulations how many causal variants do we have in a region, let's say a gene. So this is assuming there's a single causal variant. Here we have 20 causal variants. Um, 
And this orange model here is a single variant model. And you can see it performs very well if there is only one causal variant. But as soon as you have multiple causal variants, this green and, and blue model here, which is corresponding to these two approximations, either accounting or not accounting for relatedness, they do take over. And you really get quite substantial gains if you do have multiple causal variants. The second in domain is, is if you have more than one phenotype association. In other words, if there's correlated signatures between traits, if there's pleiotropy that these causal loci jointly regulate multiple phenotypes. And here, all of these models here, these are the multiple phenotypes models. This is a single trait model, variant model. These are the multivariant models. They gain power as there are um, complex architectures where multiple phenotypes are regulated by individual loci. And there's also, just to make the point that really this relatedness component can be very, very important. I mentioned this before. You can drop it sometimes. And you may be able to drop it, for particular if you have sort of discrete populations. So this is, again, this, this matrix I've shown you before. We have discrete blocks of, of populations um, here, in this case, from 1,000 genomes. In this case, you can basically just enumerate these blocks. And one very effective way to do so is, is principal component analysis. And adjust for them. You get very nice calibration of both of these methods. But if you have family structure, and you basically don't see anything here because of this projector, but there's sort of all rare scattered points here of pairs of individuals that are related to one another, then you really need this full model to, to adjust. Otherwise, you get this inflation again from the expected p-value distribution. And hence, you really, you really need to adjust for structure um, if you do have related individuals. And we also applied this to some real data. So these are four lipid traits that are part of the um, the NFBC data set, the Northern Finland Birth Cohort, LDL, HDL, CRP, and triglycerides. These are all related traits that are expected to be co-regulated in, in complex ways. This is a Manhattan plot where we actually we don't test genes, but rather we test consecutive regions in the genome in this case. And the good news is that I think all of them are validated in a meta-analysis. And we do find a few additional associations that have not been found by a, a multi-trait model that looks at single low size. It's really there's this benefit of combining the idea of, of, of testing sets in your genome and looking at, at more than one phenotype um, in, in a joint model. So I, I want to really proceed. I mean, we have now looked at methods that link genotype to phenotype, where phenotype could be more than one phenotype, but it's really this global bridge. And the question is, what can we do to look at molecular information? What can we do if we look at transcriptome data, proteome data, and so forth? And there is a real challenge. And this, this challenge is that we don't have four or five phenotypes, but rather we have tens of thousands of traits. So the number of hypotheses to consider here is really enormous. So these are 10 to the 10 tests, if you, if you think about it naively enumerating them. And before saying how we do this methodologically, here's basically what, a, what an EQTL is. What we effectively do is we correlate associations between, we consider associations between the, the expression variation of the gene of interest. So this is one gene in the human genome, AMOT. And we're considering a variance upstream and downstream of this gene. And we test again in a simple linear model variants that are close to this gene for association. Here, for example, you see in a, a loci that is upstream of AMOT. And you see the sort of genotype dependent um, ab abundance change in expression. So individuals that carry the C allele have lower expression than individuals carrying the T allele. And you can really use gene expression the same way than any other quantitative trait. It's just a measurement that we can, we can obtain for every single gene in the genome. And we can correlate differences in these abundance levels to genetic differences between people. Why should we care about EQTLs? I just added that slide because I think it's quite important to make the point that EQTLs are one of the predominant sources to actually link variants to genes. And by linking variants to genes, we might actually get new targets for therapeutic intervention. So for example, the CTTV's initiative on campus that tries really to uncover gene disease associations, gene disease associations particular for developing of drugs. The problem is we don't observe gene disease associations, but GVAS give us association between natural genetic variants, differences between people on the genome and phenotype. And even if these associations are very weak, they might be useful because the same variants might be correlated to expression changes of genes. And if they do, we, actually think we can actually understand what is the gene that are regulated by these genetic effects. And that's perhaps an important point to make, that even if the phenotypic links that we typically observe in genetics are very weak and genetic risks are small, these associations will indirectly, via studies like EQTLs, give us clues about what are the genes that are regulated by this natural genotype-phenotype associations. And this might be useful to have new anchors for developing therapeutic interventions. 
that perturb these genes to a much greater magnitude than genetics would usually do, simply because evolution made sure that these effects are small. So that is perhaps one of the main reasons why EQTLs are an important puzzle piece to understand how natural variation affects diseases via genes and molecular networks that we can then leverage for other purposes. So what's the challenge in EQTLs? Well, one of the challenges is that for many genes, we repeat a similar analysis we did before. This is another gene in chromosome 7. We're associating variants that are near these genes. So these are so-called cis associations because we only consider proximal variants. We don't find any link. And one of the reasons is not population structure. Actually, population structure in EQTLs is typically not a big issue because sample sizes are small, but rather non-genetic sample heterogeneity. So other variations between individuals Things, if you use the first principal component on your expression data set, it typically explains everything but biology. Um, PC1 is typically your operator, PC2, the day of sequencing, and, and possibly there's some freeze fall cycles and other variables. So the, the major axis of variation in our expression data set are actually good proxies for all these confounding factors that we might want to account for. Now, there's a question how to find an appropriate balance. Maybe we still have genetic structure and we have non genetic structure. It turns out there's a very nice way to combine that, um, which is, again, looking at principles that have been originally motivated in machine learning, but also in very similar contexts used in genetics, that we assume that the individual genes are independent, conditioned on a suitable covariance matrix. The covariance matrix has the genetic component in, but then also a non-genetic component. Here, here the S's, we know them because they're genetic. Here, these axes, we don't know. These are our unknown factors. We make the assumptions a low rank, and we can infer them from the data by optimizing the model parameters. And that's possible because we have tens of thousands of genes. That's the main motivation we have here. And just to give you a bit of intuition, if we would drop that term here, you would be back to a normal mixed model, like we discussed them earlier, to account for population structure. If you would drop this term here, you're doing something very, very similar than just doing PCA on your expression matrix and including the first principal component in your model. And by combining these two, you can find an appropriate balance between both terms and then obtain an effective covariance matrix that accounts for these both types of non-ID structure between individuals, both genetic and non-genetic, that you then can include in your models and, and improve your inferences um, um, for determining such um, genetic associations. I want to show you at least briefly that this works. This is one application to data from the, the Thousand Genomes Project. 2013 was the last um, paper here, and they used these approaches. This is significance. We can sort of consider different FDR cutoffs. This is the number of genes for which we can identify genetic links, so the number of genes for which we have the power to detect a genetic underpinning. And, and this is basically accounting for, for confounding here at the top. And, and not accounting for this confounding, you see this sort of quite substantial increase in power. So by in including or accounting for these sample structures, you will be able to tease apart effects that otherwise are, are not visible and detectable um, in the noise. I also want to go back to this picture I mentioned earlier that the genetic structure is basically hidden common cause on your SNPs, on your variants that you want to account for in your analysis. These non-genetic covariants are actually independent of genetics. They're just basically covariates that have an independent effect on phenotype. But what you want to do in your analysis, you want to include covariances or other background models that probably adjust for both. And it is also important to note that accounting for population structure 
basically reduces false positives. That's the main aim of that. By decoupling SNPs, by accounting for this, you reduce the number of false hits that you do find because of this covariation. But by accounting for non-genetic causes, you typically increase power to detect effects because basically you're improving the signal to noise ratio. You're taking this variation out and then true genetic effects can stand out to a greater extent. I want to pause here for a bit and, uh, and, and summarize so far the talk. Um, I, I hope I convinced you that linear mixed models are really a nice tool to adjust for non-ID sample structure. There are different types of sample structure. One of them is relatedness between people. This really goes back to genetic ancestry or close relatedness between individuals. We can compose variation between phenotype into local effects like variation in genes. And you can imagine this basically as local relatedness or allele sharing in particular region of the genome and global relatedness such as population structure. Population structure has an important component because it's not clear, as we also heard this morning, whether it actually is genetic. It may actually also track environment, which is one of the reasons why very often you might want to account for it and explain it away to then see local effects that you think are more plausible and have effects. I showed this one example in Arbidopsis, but it's very, very striking with the whole genomes and association. You can estimate both of these local and global genetic structures or allele sharing from genotype data itself in different ways, using different approaches. And there is a need or utility in, in using models that also combine different phenotypes. And that is, I think, a very a timely thing to do, given that we're now measuring, measuring more phenotypes. And the models that I talked about really are only useful for, for combining a handful of phenotypes. And as we're going forward, we're actually interested in looking at thousands of traits and, and making efficient inferences using them. There's a second part that is basically if the phenotypes are high dimensional, we can actually leverage the phenotype itself to infer that structure. And that's perhaps a surprising idea that basically the phenotypic readout gives you some clue about relatedness or structure between individuals that you don't want to um, include in your models. Things like, like smoking or many technical factors. And low rank models like principal components are again a very, very promising approach and have been widely used here. There's a, there's a challenge that these models actually also explain away true signals. And if you want to interested in it, there are some some, some, some further work on that area that I don't have time to include here, but that's a very interesting uh, discussion point. Actually, it applies also to these genetic structures. So there's also a question about removing too much, being too conservative. Um, but in many cases, it's a good thing to include this in your models. Um, I want to mention that basically this heteroneity, this type of sample structure that occurs in, in virtually any type of analysis in, 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 in population scale um, genomics and genetics, I mentioned the EQTL and QTL mapping variance component where basically individuals are not ID and we can leverage the structure or account for it. There's also an interesting question about causality when we're trying to understand what are the genes that really be lie between genotype and phenotype. And there's some work I don't have time to talk here about, but it's also here a really important point to account for this non-ID structure. And today I want to um, make a bit of a surprising, perhaps, uh, a move to single cell genomics. And I think it's a nice example to show that the same models that here originally come from genetics actually have applications elsewhere in genomics. And I think actually non-ID sample structure is probably one of the most predominant challenges in, in genomics. It's, I think, more challenging or more of an important challenge than many of the distributional assumptions we tend to be worried about, I think, Sprasson or binomial. Really, um, structure between samples or individuals is, is what, what um, invalidates many of our inferences and analysis. So this is actually what we also have a tutorial on later on. So um, I will be quite brief here, and then we go a bit more in detail in, in the afternoon session. But I, I just want to go back to that slide that I mentioned earlier, that basically um, in, in all of these analysis, we're interested in some variation we care about, like genotype to phenotype links, and variation we don't care about. And in single cell genomics, we have the same problems. Um, I have here one slide on single cell RNA-seq. It's a, it's a fantastic new technology that enables us ascertaining transcriptome variation at the sim single cell level, so typical gene expression data sets, they average across hundreds of thousands of cells in the normal case. And now we can really go to the single cell level using technologies like the Fluid MC1 system, which has recently been proposed, but also many other technologies. And that's a really exciting area because we now can study processes that happen at the single cell level. Um, some of these processes are, for example, cell differentiation, if cells differentiate, or understanding cell type decomposition, which is all something that we'll cover in the practical. But there's also a really important challenge, namely that these cells, they come in different flavors and there's different sources of confounding variation. There's technical variation, but there's also things like the cell cycle that otherwise are, 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 are average around. And, and we need to account for these types of factors to understand what we're actually interested in, to really study the variation that we would, that we would like to, to uncover. 
And here's a toy example that perhaps illustrates the point. Um, these, are, these dots here are single cells. Let's imagine we, we measure transcriptomes of these cells, and I'm looking at one gene, which is GATA3. GATA3 is a marker for T cell differentiation. So low GATA3 indicates naive T cells, high GATA3 indicates differentiated cells. So we would like to order cells along this trajectory by using this, this, this gene expression level as a marker. But now the problem is a bit like in genetics. These, these cells, they, they don't only differentiate, but they have also other properties attached. And one of them is, for example, the cell cycle state. So some of these cells might be in G1, others might be in S, others in G2M. And the actual transcriptome we measure is the sum of these two processes and looks something like this. And we would order these cells based on their abundance. We would get a very, very different answer. And you may say that's just one cherry-picked example. But actually, we see that if we correlate the whole transcriptome to cell cycle processes, we see that more than a third of the transcriptome is correlated to the cell cycle. So this, this sort of structure of cell cycle has an important um, implication. Now, to make things more challenging, we don't know about the cell cycle. So what we want to do is we want to basically take our confounded expression profiles and somehow estimate clean data that looks like the data we have at the top. So that might sound really, really difficult, but there's, there's good news, and that is that we have the methods available. All these mixed models in genetics can be applied to exactly the same problem. Back here, we had individual by individual covariance matrices that account for batch structures. And now what we want to do is we will account for, for batches that basically account for sample or cell-to-cell -cell covariance matrices. So the approach we take is we basically take a cell-by-cell -cell covariance matrix that we estimate from the expression data. And I'll tell you how that works just in due course. Once we have that, then we can basically count for these covariances and perform a task like variance decomposition, look at correlations between genes, or, or cluster and visualize our data in, in different ways. So the cue we are using here, actually, that we can get specific inferences about what cell cycle is that we, we, we have this cell by gene expression matrix, and we know which genes are good markers for the cell cycle. That's all known in, in, in literature's Go annotations in cycle databases. So we use exactly the same model I presented you in genetics, but we basically assume that only this slice of the transcriptome, these cell cycle genes, that these are independent condition on a low rank covariance matrix. So this is a, basically a factor that is rank one, is again very, very similar to PCA. There's just residual variance, which is an um, important point to include. So in the end, that approach gives again rise to a covariance matrix. And here, dark red colors indicate the two cells are in the same cell cycle state, and blue indicates they're not in the same cell cycle state. So we don't need to know where they are. It's basically just looking like relatedness between people. We don't need to account for in which is the population they are in, but we just want to know are they in the same population or are in different populations, are related to another because of family, or they're not related because of family. And here, family is effectively the cell cycle state. There are three big families. There's G1, S, and G2M, and all the bits in between. And this covariance may just basically tell us how similar are any pairs of cells um, in terms of their cell cycle state. Now, there's one aspect which is textual noise. And I think I will skip that um, here and go back in the afternoon session. But there's an important question about single cell transcriptomes. The technical noise variation is really important to account on. Actually, we include this by including another term in our model that we estimate using spike and standards. And we, we go over that briefly in, in the afternoon. But once we have estimated this, we can basically ask questions about variance decomposition. We can take the expression of a gene. We can decompose it into the cell cycle component by, by leveraging this random effect component we've estimated, this covariance matrix. We, we can look at the residual biological variation. That's everything we don't explain. And the technical noise, again, I'll, I'll, I'll mention later on, that we estimate by, by a spike in standards. So the first question when deriving such a model is actually, does it capture true cell cycle differences? Is this, does this work? I mean. I, I told you that we use gene sets that we believe can explain cell cycle to estimate that, but, but does it really work in practice? And what we had here, the fortunate opportunity to look at a data set of 300 ES cells that have been staged for cell cycle in Sarah Teichmann's lab. So these cells we know experimentally whether the G1S or G2M. So we have experimental standards. And what we then can do is we can take our model and ask the question, are these variance estimates concordant when we use the ground truth cell cycle state versus if we just use the expression data? And this here on the x-axis, every dot is a gene. This is the explained variance, the proportion of variance attributed to the cell cycle for every gene using a model-based estimate that doesn't use the ground truth standard here. And the y-axis, just a standard ANOVA based on these, on these free uh, class variables. And you can see this nicely correlates, suggesting that really using such a simple latent variable model 
you can estimate a biologically meaningful variable that in this case corresponds to cell cycle status. You can also take out the residuals. So you can basically regress out the blob from these data, and then you can see that this, this structure is almost void, except for a little bit of, of S phase. And you can basically correct your data sets from such structures, in this case, from the cell cycle, by adjusting for it in, in your analysis. I want to give you one example how this makes a difference in practice, and we'll cover that later more in the afternoon. Here, this is again this naive T cells to differentiate T cells, this lineage. We're looking at 96 cells that are propagating from here to here. We would expect them to sort of cover that entire dynamic space. The first question we ask is how important is the cell cycle? And that's a variance component analysis where we average over different genes. So these are all the genes with 10, 0 to 10% explained by technical, non-technical variants. And here, um, everything is biological. This blue back here, this is technical noise. You can see that almost all genes are sort of drawing in this technical noise component. There's very little variation as biological. But out of the biological variation, the cell cycle component, this orange here, is really the predominant source of variation. So more than 42% um, of the genes, a third of the variation is cell cycle. And if you exclude the technical noise here, it's even, even more. So cell cycle is really the dominant source of variation. As you can imagine, that has substantial consequences if you're problem analysis. So here I'm showing a gene-gene correlation analysis. We're correlating every gene with every other gene. This is unadjusted data. You get these very dense correlation structures um, that are sort of suspicious in the sense that the whole transcriptome is correlated to one another. And indeed, if you adjust for the cell cycle, there's just this tiny correlation structure left, and the genes that appear are much more related to the biological question of interest. So again, cell cycle or structure between cells induces correlations in another domain here, gene by gene correlations, that are actually misleading and false positives if you don't adjust for this. Perhaps the most interesting question is if you look at structure between cells. This is a principal component analysis, actually a nonlinear principal component analysis using a, a GPLVM. On the unadjusted data, if you perform cell cycle adjustment, you see these two clusters. And these two clusters exactly correspond to the plot I showed you in the very beginning of the talk, where we have on the left hand the GATA3 low population. These are undifferentiated. On the right, a GATA3 high population are differentiated. You actually find like a whole mark of differentiation marks that indicate that indeed these two populations correspond to two meaningful biological subclusters that only become visible when removing this variation or this structure between cells due to the cell cycle. <coughs> I want to mention where, where, where things are going um, in the field here. We are, we are very interested in looking at more than one type of structure. We have cell cycle. We might also have this differentiation signature itself when we've identified which genes are differentiating or differentially expressed between differentiated and undifferentiated cells. We could sort of decompose this even further and look at variation due to cell cycle, differentiation factors. And, and you would expect that this, this, this works and actually does. You can now augment this analysis and, and, and look at differentiation signatures. You can even look at interactions of these processes and ask, is there a multiplicative interplay between those, uh, these two processes? And that's what I'm showing here. So basically, this is the expression of a gene. This is the reconstructed cell cycle factor. What you can see here is that this red population, which are differentiated cells, have a much stronger effect on cell cycle than the undifferentiated ones, which is expected because cell cycle and differentiation of cells are actually tightly linked, also for biological reasons. In the last slide, I just want to sh show you that, that basically the single cell field has many, many parallels with genetics now coming up. What is now available is from the same cells to capture both the DNA and the RNA. So we can profile DNA and RNA from the same cells and can ask questions like association genetics or the epigenome. So here we have now first data sets where we have epigenetic variation and transcriptome variation. And basically, we can, we can associate differences between cells at the genetic or epigenetic level to transcriptional changes very much in the same way that we previously could do in, 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 in human genetics. Here's just one example where we can observe some information. This is um, ESRB, it's a pluripotency gene in ES cells. This is a binned epigenome transcriptome association analysis. Here, these dark regions, these are significant associations of two regions. And here we can see that basically methylation state is correlated or associated with transcriptome association state. So we'll be able to perform epigenome-wide association studies or genetic association studies on the single cell side very much in the same way than in the, in the human genetic sense. With that, I want to finish. Here's basically this sort of picture I showed at the beginning. We have genetic differences at the top. We have phenotypic differences at the bottom. And all these different epigenetic transcriptome protein molecular variation data. And 
And I, I think I hopefully motivated that many of these challenges that you see in, in population genetics and statistical genetics actually translate one to one to other fields. In this case, uh, single cell genomics, where we're also able to profile pairs of these layers in the same way that we can look at differences between people. And the statistical methodology is, is also very closely related. And account for non ID sample structure is one of the key challenges that need to be overcome. With this, some closing comments. I said most of this already. Random effect covariance models are a flexible tool to adjust for different types of covariances. This can account for population structure, genetic covariances, but also for covariances that are technical. That can increase power and accuracy in these analyses and is a workhorse tool now in association genetics. And there's an interesting link to other fields like single cell biology where we again have variation and we're trying to correlate different entities and need to account for the variation we don't care about to really see what we want to study, such as cell differentiation or epigenome transcriptome variation um, or other links. I guess I just want to acknowledge people. This is really um, results from many collaborations in, in the lab. Florian Büttner and Paolo Casale did the cell cycle work, Barbara Rakic and Carl Paolo, the, epi the, the multi phenotype modeling. There's a very nice collaboration with Neil Lawrence and, and Nicolo, who's actually now at Microsoft, on the, on the, on the EQTL side and, and many other people been involved in. Thank you for listening.